Logan, Yuri, welcome to the Development by David podcast. My new friend, how are you? Hi, so happy to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. I've really, really loved the world of behavioral science recently. You've probably seen my recent guests. They've all been embedded in that that field. And you're one of the greatest thinkers in that space. So, geez, I'm really grateful to have you. Have you still like? Thank you. I, I feel like I'm definitely standing on the shoulders of giants and just, you know, applying other people's thoughts to the world of dating relationships, but I'm very glad to hear that it's been useful to you. So for the five listeners who don't know who you are, um, <laughs> and they're not freaking out like I am, um, <laughs> probably probably because they're either deeply in love or blissfully single or somewhere in between, who is Logan Yuri today in 2022? Yeah. Who am I? I am an author. I wrote a book that, of course, we're going to talk about today. I am married. I've been married for two years to my husband, and we had our official wedding in June of this year. I also live with about 14 people in this communal intentional living community, which is a big part of my life. That's called Radish. So I'm a Radish. And then I also work as a dating coach. I lead dating coaching classes. And of course, I work at Hinge. My title is the Director of Relationship Science. I don't know how you find the time. <laughs> <laughs> I also noticed that on the month of your marriage, you were featured on the New York Times and on the cover of their, their business section, right? How did that feel? Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, that was a really interesting experience. You know, I've done a lot of podcasts. And so when you do a podcast, you kind of get to own the narrative and explain what you want to say and put things in your own words. And this was my first time having a reporter sort of follow me around and then say like, this is what I see. And here's how I interpret this person. And so I would say it was a bit more vulnerable, but it was a great experience and some really cool business opportunities came out of it. So yeah, that was just like a really fun, I wouldn't even say bucket list thing, because I didn't even know that was possible. But it was definitely a really cool experience. I'm sure those around you are just so proud of that news. So Director of Relationship Science at Hinge, what does relationship science mean? Surely there is no science about relationships. Surely it's just something that happens to you, right? I feel like you're you're setting me up for a good one. Yeah, <laughs> so I would say... Uh, Relationship science is the academic field that studies love, attraction, dating, how we make connections, what makes relationships last long term, etc. And so yes, there definitely is an academic field of this. And so part of my role at Hinge is getting to conduct research into what's going on with dating? What are people doing these days? How is it impacting the way that people are showing up? And so um, I have this opportunity to take lessons from this amazing field of relationship science and apply it to people's lives, apply it to research at Hinge, really use it to help people find love. Can I ask, you may not have a, a standalone example, but what is something that you've found throughout your research that's been most surprising about human behavior in the context of relationships? Yeah. You know, I've been doing this a long time and I feel like I still am surprised. I'm surprised by how many smart people struggle with love. You meet these people who are so successful. They have everything in their life together, right? They're, they're really have a great job. They're really intelligent. They're funny. They have strong relationships with friends and family. They are fit. They are healthy. And then they're like, I just am so blocked on this one thing. And so I feel like dating and relationships are very humbling because you could be so successful elsewhere and still struggle struggle with this. And so that's one thing that never fails to surprise me is just how much help we need with this because it's so important and it's also very hard. I love that. And I think I've seen that unfold within the workplace. I find some of the most intellectually gifted and hardworking people who can apply a lot of logic, science and sense making to other facets, not be able to find love. Um, I love how, how that rings true within your research. What, what what was your journey into this role? What did life look like previously for Logan? And what was your, yeah. what, what were your personal motivations that um, led you to wanting to unlock the behaviors that underpin love? Yeah. So, you know, it's always interesting. Like after everything happens, you can put together a narrative and be like, because of this, this happened. And I, I want to be, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the tale, but I'm sure it's been mythologized along the way. So just as a <laughs> grain of salt, but yeah, I've, you know, I've just always been so interested in two things, psychology and 
dating, relationships, sex, et cetera. And so this has come out in different ways in my life. So in college, I studied psychology undergrad. I had the chance to work in a lab, but I also had this really fun experience where I wrote a sociology paper on pornography and you know, it wasn't a thesis or anything, but it was really fun. It was a chance to say like, Hey, you can actually apply an academic lens to something that people don't usually think is very academic. And I can actually talk to people and ask them questions and be invasive and sit in their dorm room with them. And, you know, say, when's the first time you masturbated and like ask them things that feel so not allowed in normal life. And so that was an interesting experience. Then when I graduated college, I really wanted to move to the Bay Area, live in San Francisco. And so I applied to jobs in tech and I got my first job at Google. And I did the very basic out of college Google job, which is managing Google ads for companies. But the quirky part was that my companies that I was managing were porn pornographers, porn websites, sex toy operators, things like that. And so once again, I was kind of doing this more, um, you know, not necessarily academic, but I was doing this corporate thing, but it had this interesting kind of like sex and pornography lens. And then in my time at Google, I had the opportunity to work with Dan Ariely, who if your fans haven't heard of, he is an amazing behavioral scientist. He wrote an incredible book that's really important in the field called Predictably Irrational. And he was actually doing a stint at Google as a kind of like a consultant. And so I had the opportunity to switch jobs and work full time with him. And so I helped lead this team called the Irrational Lab. Basically, what we did was we took lessons from behavioral science, things like somebody's more likely to sign up for your product if they have an identity. So have them choose an avatar when they sign up, things like that. And we applied it to Google products. At the same time, I was single and I was dating and I was on Tinder and I was like, wow, this is a whole new world. This is so confusing. I'm having a hard time. Everyone else is having a hard time. And so inspired by that, I started this Talks at Google series where I would interview different people, um, Esther Perel, Dan Savage, John Gottman, big people in the field of relationships. And I would use that as an opportunity to ask them my questions. And people at Google got really into it and came to all the events. They were on YouTube. And so I was like, all right, there's something here. People need help with dating and relationships. And so I basically took these ideas and brought them together. And I ended up doing one-on-one -on -one dating coaching, helping people find love. And then I decided to write a book. And what I did was I took the best of behavioral science, why people make bad decisions, and I applied that to dating and relationships. And that's what makes my book different. Not because I'm a world famous behavioral scientist, which I'm definitely not, but because I took these two fields of dating relationships and behavioral science, and I combined them to say, hey, getting into a relationship is a series of decisions. You're making bad decisions along the way. If you can make different ones, you're actually going to have this unlock moment and be able to actually find a relationship. And was it the book that led you to your current role? Yeah. So when I, I had written my book, but it hadn't come out yet. And a friend of mine worked at Hinge and referred me to this amazing role in at Hinge and the Hinge Labs team. And so it was like the book gave me the credibility for the Hinge job. And then the Hinge job has been so amazing because I've been there since March 2020, which as you'll remember, was basically the start of the pandemic in many parts of the world. And so I've been tracking what's going on with pandemic dating for a long time. I've been tracking trends. And so it's like, you know, if anyone's listening and wants career advice, it's like, I had this passion, psychology and then dating. I pursued it in different ways. I could never have told you I'm going to get this dream job at Hinge, but everything came together. And you know that expression, it's like, when opportunity knocks, have your shoes on. That's how it felt. It was like I was eligible for the Hinge job because I had been doing this research and writing for many years before I'd even heard of this job. I love that. That's such an amazing Genesis story, Logan. And similarly, because I've been interviewing amazing people like you in this field, I've just switched role actually at KPMG. Wow. Uh, to a human centric design. Um, That's so, so, so cool. And there's just a podcast, it's things outside of my career, which are part of my yeah. career that have enabled this. And I love how your story is like the hallmark of that, the hallmark example. It's amazing. Yeah, I definitely feel like there's a connection here where you're like, I'm figuring out who I am, what life I want, what career I want. If I can have this podcast, 
and bring in people that I want to learn from, that's actually a way to get that type of mentorship. And so I feel like we are doing something similar where my toxic Google modern romance thing was similar to yours, where you're like, wow, I can like get direct mentorship from people if I come up with this platform <laughs> to interview them. I think it's great. Oh, I love it. Um, one of the insights that I read from your book was that, and I, I don't know what time this statistic was taken, but 50% of marriages end in divorce and ultimately ultimately the um, dating is harder than ever. I mean, if my surgeon said to me, David, this, um, this transplant has 50% chance of success, I probably wouldn't take it unless it was absolutely vital. So what are the greatest challenges in today's dating world? Yeah. And I should say, you know, the divorce rate did peak basically around the 80s and it's gone down since and it's also lower among different groups. So if you get married a little bit later, if it's your first marriage, um, if you are more educated, there are groups in which the marriage rate is lower. Why do you think the 80s? What do you think caused? Oh, caused that you know, um, basically there was the beginning of what was called no fault divorce. So in the past, you needed to have a reason why you got divorced and it made it more challenging for women to ask for divorce. Or basically there was the invent of no fault divorces. There was also ma- way more women in the workplace. And so in general, what we see in society is that if women have fewer economic resources, it's harder for them to ask for a divorce. But once women were working and they had more resources, there was actually an opportunity for them to say, hey, I don't want to be in this anymore. And we're increasingly seeing that. And so it is interesting, you know, in communities where um, at at least in straight couples, men and women like make the same amount of money, we see different dynamics play out in relationships than when, let's say, for example, the man has way more money. But um, since then, that number has dropped a bit, but it's still very high. And I agree with you. It's like, why are we, you know, why are we buying a toaster that has a high rate of, of failure? And so that's in one way, the reason why I do this work is that I'm like, well, there are ways to help protect against that toaster breaking, or as you said, you know, the, the surgeon messing up. And so a lot of what I do is try to say to people, here's how to choose the right partner. Here's how to keep love alive. These are the challenges that couples face. Here's how to overcome them. And so I'd say, you know, it is a, it is challenging, but there's definitely a certain type of effort that you can put in that helps give your relationship a much better chance at survival. I love that. What are the biggest challenges then? Yeah. So I have that chapter in my book called Why Dating Now is Harder Than Ever Before. It goes through some of the sociological things happening right now. So one is that in the past, we really used to get a lot of our lives, a lot of our identity passed down from us. And so for example, if I were born 300 years ago, I would have been a Jewish woman living in Berlin in a somewhat Orthodox Jewish family, and I would have known what to wear. I would have had a matchmaker or my dad tell me who to marry. I probably wouldn't have gone to school and I would have known how I spent Shabbat. It was like my whole life would be predetermined for me. And so now we have way more freedom, and that's really exciting. But that freedom also means that we are writing our own stories, and that can be very stressful because when you are the writer of your story, if you don't like the story that you write, you only have yourself to blame. And so this is a lot more of an autonomous thing. Instead of saying, well, I'll just see who the matchmaker sets me up with, you have to decide. And so we are doing this much more on our own than in the past. Another thing that has changed is that people are living way longer. And so you have this relationship where you get married and you're 20s or 30s, and you're going to be together for the long haul. That is many more years than perhaps used to be expected when lifespans were shorter. Another thing is that we get lessons from people like Warren Buffett and Sheryl Sandberg telling us, this is the most important decision you'll ever make. Your partner determines your whole life. And so there's tons of pressure on us. And then finally, dating apps can be great because they give us a lot of options. We're not just limited to, you know, the 10 people in our village, but it also means that it's hard to choose. And sometimes we suffer from decision paralysis and we feel like we can't make a decision because we don't know who else is out there. And so dating right now has many advantages, but it can also make you feel really alone and that you're the one who's responsible for making this life for yourself. 
Wow, that does make the landscape feel so intimidating, Logan, but I know we'll touch on some of the lessons on how to overcome these. I also feel, and I know you touched upon it in your book, it's one of the things that I resonated most with was the lack of uh, role models. Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I forgot that one. <laughs> Thank you for reminding <laughs> me. That's so helpful. Well, that, that was one that spoke to me most. Um, and I spoke offline about the premise of this podcast. It's to break down very technical um, subjects or provide role models. And most of the things that aren't technical are taught by your parents, like riding a bike or tying a shoelace. Um, we learn through osmosis and watching what our parents do. That being said, and you touched upon it within your, your points there, the modality in which we date has changed since our parents' generation. Totally. We're, we're looking online. Has the change in modality coupled with poor dating role models um, disabled our generation's ability to know how to date? Yeah. So let's talk about the role models thing first. I mean, I think about this all the time. It's like if you didn't have anyone in your family, in your neighborhood who had a healthy relationship, how do you know what that looks like? How do you know that it's healthy to fight and then make up and then kiss each other again? How do you know that it's okay to say like, hey, this didn't make me feel good? There's there's all this negotiation and communication that's really nuanced that if you didn't grow up with healthy role models, you just don't know how it works. And I've heard this from my clients all the time where they say things like, no one, you know, my parents never fought. And then one day they fought and they got divorced. So the story in my head was that if you fight, you get divorced. So when their partner's start to fight with them, they freak out because they think it means the end because they didn't have a healthy role model for healthy fighting and communication. And so one big thing is that a lot of us can only look to movies or to our friends, which may not be very good role models either. And so we really have to figure this out from scratch. And sometimes the first healthy relationship that we see is actually our own. The second piece is that, yeah, I think that dating nowadays on the apps is just totally different from being set up by friends or trying to meet someone out and about, and there's positives and negatives. So for example, we know from this research in the United States that as of 2019, and these numbers have probably gotten even higher since the pandemic, meeting online is the number one way that couples meet. And so 39% of straight couples and 65% of queer couples meet online. And so this is clearly the dominant way. That being said, some negatives include the fact that you might feel like you are constantly swiping, waiting for the next perfect person. You might feel like you're not attractive and maybe your profile isn't great and you're being passed over, but if somebody could meet you in person, it would really be great. And so I think for some people, it really expands the market. And for other people, it almost expands it too much where they don't know how to make a great decision for themselves. I think I would struggle most with how to present myself. I'm assuming that I've bypassed quite a lot of people on a dating app who I would have found really attractive in real life, but I haven't found attractive on an app. Such things would propel that, like, like the way they dance or the kind of quirky smile they have when they tell yeah. a joke these things cannot be replicated in an app or can they can how, how best do you embody your authentic self within the limited parameters that an app give you to display yourself yeah. So one thing I would say that hinge is doing really well is hinges profiles are getting closer and closer to mimic what it'd be like to meet someone in person. So obviously, you know, on the app, I can't smell you or I can't, you know, exactly understand like what it would be like to be with you, but I could see your quirky smile because you would have a picture of it. I could hear you tell a joke or laugh because you can have an audio prompt. And so there's actually a lot of ways in modern profiles, especially on hinge to really show someone who you are. And so do you want me to get into, you know, what makes a great profile? I would love to. Yeah. So we've done such cool research on this at Hinge. And a lot of it is about telling a story and about showing variety. And so you want someone to see, this is what dating me would be like. This is who I am. This is what I'm looking for. And you can get that variety by having different types of photos, answering the prompts in different ways. You know, you don't want every picture of to be, you know, you at a football match or you with your dog, show us different sides of yourself and help us really see like, what is your life like and show us that it's very full and something that we'd want to be a part of. I love it. I'm going to be like clipping that and posting that as my trailer content. That'll be my mic drop oh, moment great. for me <laughs> and adding it to my personal notes so I can update my own so profile. Glad. I love it. One of the other things I love 
learning from you are the three dating tendencies. Can we go over what the maximizer, romanticizer and hesitator are? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I've been doing a lot of coaching over the years and I had all these different clients from different countries and different cultures and ages. And I was like, there's really a lot of stuff that they have in common. And what I notice is that they all seem to have unrealistic expectations, but of different things. And so that's where this framework comes from. And so the first type is the romanticizer and they have unrealistic expectations of relationships. And so this is the person who says, I'm going to find my soulmate. I'll know exactly what they look like. We're going to have this meet cute. And they're very, very focused on a particular type of relationship. And they think that it's not going to take any work. And they think, oh, if it is work, if I must be doing it wrong. It must not be the right person. The second type is the maximizer. And they have unrealistic expectations of their partner. And so this is the person who's like, oh, she's great, but couldn't I find someone who's just like her, but a little bit more ambitious or a little bit hotter? There's always like this need to keep researching and finding the next person. And then eventually you'll find the perfect one. And then the third type is the hesitator. And they have unrealistic expectations of themselves. They are the person who says, I'm just not dateable yet. I'm just not ready. I have to lose weight. I have to get a more impressive job. And they're actually not even putting themselves out there because they feel like they're not ready yet. I love that. I think that's such a fundamental insight into those three um, tendencies. I want to ask a question around the romanticizer. And it's the concept of having a type. Like, why do you personally think people have a type? For me, if I were to put my finger in the sky as an absolute novice in this field, it would be probably because of some sort of pattern recognition. They have found comfort in a certain type in the past or on the flip side to that, having have been in endangered relationships because of a certain type. Do you think it's something evolutionary in terms of pattern recognition or do you think it's something broader than that, Logan? Yeah, I mean, I I really like that question. And I think you framed it in an interesting way. I mean, I could throw it back to you and say, you know, why does somebody have a favorite type of food? Or why does somebody prefer this type of music over another? I mean, in some ways, I think that preferences are hard to describe, right? Like it might be that you prefer Italian food to Mexican food because you grew up eating really good Italian food and there was no good Mexican food in Scotland. And so you haven't been exposed to it. And so I think sometimes it's just what we've been exposed to, but yes, sometimes people develop types and it could be you had a crush on a movie star and you've always liked someone with dark hair and blue eyes, or your first girlfriend looked like this. Where it gets complicated is in this concept called attachment theory, where sometimes we like someone because we actually are sort of addicted to the drama of it, or we have a a negative definition of love. And so there's people who are anxiously attached and they feel like love is pursuing someone and that person pulling away. And so when they like someone and that person rejects them, they get really excited and they're like, Ooh, he's not good enough for me. I have to pursue him. Let's see if he'll like me. And it's like in that chase that they get very excited. And that's their type is liking people who don't like them. The corollary to that is people who are avoidant attached. They feel like their definition of love is, oh, they come on too strong. They smother me. I lose my space. And so once they get into relationship and someone starts to get closer, they pull away. And so sometimes our type is actually a bad pattern that we've gotten into and that we really need to break that pattern in order to find a healthy, secure relationship. I love that. Um, I think it's going to be a common response to all everything that you see. I love it because this is one of my favorite episodes so already. Sweet. So um, sweet. Thank you. Logan, can we talk about compatibility in that sense? Some people might be blinded that, in, in the concept of the romanticizer, be blinded that not every single star aligns. I read, I think it's Alain de Paton's The Course of Love, and I've, I've got a quote somewhere. I think it's something along the lines of, compatibility Mm -hmm. is the achievement of marriage or the achievement of love no it's prerequisite yeah amazing quote yeah i love him yeah so so what what is compatibility yeah i mean i would agree with him on that i feel like people have this people throw these words around compatibility chemistry and i feel like we don't always know exactly what the other person is saying but i find that people are often wrong about what they think they need to get 
from their partner. So for example, they might think, well, I'm really extroverted and you're really introverted. So we aren't compatible. When in the end, we know that a lot of couples are different and they complement each other. Or, you know, I'm really into drinking wine and you don't drink. So we're not compatible. Well, that's also not true. We can have different hobbies. And so I believe that compatibility is much more about what side of you do I bring out? What side of me do you bring out? When we're together, what emerges between the two of us? And it's much more about how we are as a couple than about who, who each of us is on paper or on our resume. And so I don't worry as much about you know the word compatibility. I think much more about who are you around this person? Is that who you want to be? Because that's who you're going to be in the relationship if you choose that person. Yeah, totally. I'm reminded of three types of relationships that I've either post-rationalize from what I've read or experienced myself and those three types would be an ownership where one person dominates the preferences of the other and the task and the exercises that they, they do together. The second would be a partnership, much like a partnership in a business. Hobbies and um, events are s- transactional. So I will go to the football game because she likes the football game and in respect to that, she must watch Breaking Bad with me because that's my thing. And it's <laughs> kind of to and throw kind of transaction. And then the, lastly, that's that would be a relationship where you both choose an event or an experience that perhaps you haven't experienced uh, solely or you have, mm-hmm. but you, you build on that together, almost like, I don't know, building a jigsaw puzzle or doing like a model car together, something that's almost project-like that's growing you as a couple towards a unanimous goal. Um, so I've seen those three types of um, relationships unfold. Have, would you say that rings true? Yeah, I haven't heard that framework before, but I think it's really interesting, especially I like the first one where it's like in some couples, you know, one person's preferences really dominate. And I feel like I've definitely seen that. And it's even one of the reasons why I don't always like relationships that have a huge age difference, because I feel like the older person kind of takes on like the mentor capacity and is like, oh, like, I'll show you how to travel. I'll show you you how to read the good books, but it's not really equal. It's like one person's the mentor and one person's the mentee. But yeah, I feel like I can think of examples of those three different types. And I I think that's a a cool framework that I hadn't been exposed to before. Oh, amazing. And to dip back into the maximizer, you bring to life this amazing age-old adage of the secretary problem. What is it and how does it apply to dating? Yeah. So this is something that I came across in a book called Algorithms to Live By, which people might want to check out. It has a lot of interesting examples. But basically the idea is that we often don't know when to stop. So if we're doing a search, we don't know how long to search and at what point to say like we found the right thing. And so this is part of a line of mathematical inquiry called optimal stop theory. And so here's how the original one works and then I'll apply it to dating. So imagine you're hiring this secretary and you have a hundred possible candidates. And the rules are that after you interview each one, you have to say yes or no. You can't go back and get someone from before. So you probably don't want to choose someone too early on because you don't know what's out there. But you don't want to wait until the end because what if you've already let all the good people pass you by? And so the answer to this is that you should interview a third, 33%, of the applicants and say, who was the best person among that third? That is now your benchmark person. The next time that you find someone who's better than your benchmark person, you hire them right away. So who is my top person of the first 33? Maybe it was number 13. Great. And then next time, you know, maybe I'm talking to 52 and I'm like, all right, this person is even better than number 13. Then I hire that person. So that's how it works for hiring. So for dating, It's a little more complicated because you don't know how many people you're going to date. So what they do in this book is they say, imagine hypothetically, you're going to date from 18 to 40. What would be 33% of the way to 40? It would be 26.1 years of age. So by the time you're 26, you've probably dated somebody great. That person is your benchmark person. So after 26, when you meet someone who's better than your benchmark, that's the person you should try to be with. That's the person you should commit to. And this sounds very precise because I'm using numbers, but it's actually almost something I want people to see as a metaphor. The point is you've probably already dated somebody who would be great. And instead of spending the rest of your life looking for someone even better and always trying to trade up, understand that you 
find someone great and you build a relationship with them, you don't sit around waiting for the perfect relationship. And that seems like a very polarized mindset and thing to do than what the hesitator would do. Like the hesitator has to wait until they're ready within themselves and comfortable with their own identity until they start dating. But by doing that, they have bypassed however many years and weeks of potential dating to understand what they like and what they don't like and to have that stop loss almost. Is the idea of rebuttaling the mindset of a hesitator to fail lots, just not big? Yeah, I think there's a couple things. So one is that just in general in life, you're never 100% ready for anything. Like I've spoken to so many entrepreneurs who are like, I didn't know what I was doing, but I had an idea and I was willing to give it a shot. And I think it's the same thing. It's like, when I quit my job to do this full time, like I didn't know where I would wind up and I still don't know where I wind up, but I was like, I believe in myself. And so part of it is knowing there's no such thing as hundred percent ready for anything, including dating. The other thing is this false belief that, oh, I'll fix myself, quote unquote, and then I'll be eligible for dating when actually so much of that work happens through dating. So if you have trouble communicating your needs, instead of just going to a therapist and talking about that week after week, you could be in a relationship where you practice communicating your needs. And so you really need to be out there to get those skills. And the last thing is that it's not always obvious who's going to make you happiest long term. And so the best way to figure out who you should be with is by dating different people, trying them on and saying, this person felt great. This person was actually smart, but kind of arrogant. And so if you hesitate and you're not dating, you're missing out on the opportunity to learn these really important lessons. I often see Instagram reels or posts around um the best relationship I can have is with myself or I need to love by love myself before yeah. I love someone else. Is that accurate or can you learn to love yourself through a potential partner or relationship? Yeah, this is something I think about a lot. Before I wrote my book, I wrote a list of all the things that contradicted each other in dating. So there was like birds of a feather flock together and opposites attract. Another one was um, your partner will complete you. And the other one was first you have to be complete and then you'll attract a partner. And so, you know, that's kind of relates to the one that we're talking about. And so I would say that it is true that the more work that you do on yourself and the more that you can kind of like own your past and be interesting and read good books and have stuff to talk about, the more attractive you'll be. But I don't think it's true that you have to achieve this sort of self-actualization and then date. You can do those things in parallel. You can be going to therapy, reading interesting books, volunteering, becoming a better person while also dating. And so I really want to resist this message of first I need to solve myself and then I can date because I actually think, you know, so much of life is relational and it's not until you're in those relationships that you actually get to practice this. And so mental health and therapy, all of those things are great, but do them in parallel with dating. And that's how you'll get better at dating. You reminded me of uh, a post that you reshared on Instagram the other day that I found hilarious. It was brilliant. And it was a screenshot of te a text message from someone from Hinge. Yeah. It said, be right back therapy. And the, <laughs> the, the quote tweet was, this text counts as foreplay. What did you find so great about that tweet? I think it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that was a real tweet. Yeah, so that was a real tweet that my friend sent. That was a real text that my friend sent to me. And then my uh, commentary was, this text counts as foreplay. And so <laughs> the, the point was basically like, we've done so much research on this at Hinge that mental health is such a big deal. The pandemic was so hard on people. It used up our resilience. People are having a hard time. And it really just feels like people are attracted to someone who's working on their mental health, whether it's journaling, meditation, in therapy. And so it's gone from being something stigmatized to something where people are like, yeah, that's hot. Tell me about your therapy, <laughs> because that means that I'm dating someone who's working on themselves and is hopefully somewhat self-aware. Oh, I love it. I love it. What I about, also... you, you know, in Scotland or in the people you know, like, are people in therapy? Do people talk about therapy or has that, is that not really a thing there yet? I think there is an upwards trend. And so I, I'm going to view this from a male perspective because my collective of friends are, are, are predominantly male. There is an increasing trend of my seeing my friends going to therapy, but it's not where it should be. There is still a stigma that um, men are weak. And I'm mm. using inverted totally. here, that 
um, men are weak if they go to therapy. Um, there is a lag in culture because, especially where I live, it is a kind of this is a very blue collar working class area where these tropes are kind of hallmarked into existence. But there is thankfully an upwards trend but now that i've seen <laughs> that screenshot on your your instagram that apparently going to therapy is hot i might be getting like five six sessions a week now yay um, yeah do it <laughs> talk about it on dates i think people love it i love it one of the other things that i really admired about your book and it was the chapter i think it's something along the lines of look for a life partner mm -hmm. instead of a prom date or not a prom date yeah what what is a prom date and why do we feel compelled to prioritize them through our rose tinted glasses? Yeah, I mean, it, it goes a little bit back to what we were talking about before, where you were like, where do you develop a type? And so I think the prom date is some people's first type. And so it's like, when you're in high school and you're going to the prom, you're picking someone. Who is this person? Someone you're attracted to, someone you want to dance with, take pictures with, maybe kiss at the end of the night. But you're not thinking about things like, is this person reliable? Will they pick up my kids from the dentist? Will they help my ailing parents? You're just thinking about different things. And that's fine when you're in high school. But way too many people keep going after that prom date type and don't find someone who's really going to be there for them for the long term. And so what I encourage people to do is to make this mental shift towards the life partner, that person who is really meant to, you know, help them long term and support them and love them and take turns, you know, being in charge and being passive and helping out and just like all the beautiful things that lead to a long term relationship. And so way too many people start with the prom date, but don't actually graduate to the life partner. I love that term graduate. If I were to reflect on that concept, I would believe people have a predisposition to choose the prom date because they're choosing familiar pain over unfamiliar pain. And this is a concept that familiar pain is that they know what outcomes that person will typically deliver based on previous patterns. But going for someone new that has new hobbies, new tastes and traits and interests and responsibilities, that uncertainty, and I think uncertainty is the worst human behavior to to consume and, and totally. to have I think people would rather have familiar pain than unfamiliar pain and I, that would be my assumption to why that may happen yeah I mean I think that's interesting and that's sort of suggesting that either way you have pain but one thing is that people who go from anxiously attached relationships Relationships to secure relationships, they're often like, holy cow, this is totally different. Like, I didn't realize that we could fight productively. I didn't realize that when I'm feeling like I miss you, instead of yelling at you, you know, we just talk about it. And so sometimes we're addicted to a certain unhealthy type of relationship, and there's an antidote to that in which we don't have to experience it. And so I would say every type of relationship has problems. You should choose the set of problems you want. But I don't know that it's always necessarily like one pain for the other. I think there's actually relationships that are less painful because you're breaking a bad habit. One of my favorite broader life quotes reflecting on that is, a dream life is not a life without problems. It's a life where you have problems that you want to solve. And reflecting on some of the anecdotes that you brought to life, some people look at their parents and think, if I have one problem with my partner, I must divorce them, I yeah. must leave them. But like you said, you can fight productively. And I think that overarching quote brings that to life a little bit more. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's really great research from John Gottman, who's one of the biggest field names in the field of relationship science. And their research says that 69% of relationship problems are perpetual. And so that means that you never get over them. And so if you are a person that likes to go to the airport early and your partner likes to get there late, you're not going to convince the other person to be different. You're always going to fight about this. And so part of it is understanding my job is not to convince you of my path or to change you. It's to come up with some techniques that help us live together. So maybe that means that I get to the airport myself and then you stroll in right as we're boarding the plane and I don't worry about you and you, you get there yourself. It's not about me constantly being frustrated if you're later. And so we don't have to change someone and we don't have to have a perfect relationship. We have to be able to handle the set of problems that the relationship brings and know that any relationship would bring some set of problems. Would you remedy that by almost entering a relationship with something that looks like a contract almost, like a set of rules, like a roadmap or rules, rules of the road type thing? 
How would you yeah. kind of remedy that up front? I mean, I don't know that there is a remedy. I think part of it is just saying like, I am not searching for perfection. If you think every time we hit a problem, that's kind of the romanticizer thing must be the wrong relationship for me. So I should get out. You're going to get stuck because you're going to keep searching for something that doesn't exist. Instead, I would say, find the problems that you can deal with. Maybe you can deal with lateness, but you can't deal with lying. Or maybe you're vegan and dating somebody who eats meat is just absolutely not going to work for you. And so step one is really finding the set of problems that you know, as you said, are interesting to you or, th or that you can handle. I do have this idea in my book of the relationship contract, but that's not really for entering the relationship. That's more after you are in an established relationship with someone, you can explore, you know, who do we want to be together? What rituals do we want? How can I show up for you? It's a way to really get into the details and catalyze this conversation about what type of relationship are we building. That makes complete sense to me. And I'm sure the listeners are jotting down notes as we speak Logan so before we got to that point or get to that point and I reflect on your statistic of 39% of people meet online if people meet me in person in real life or prefer that modality how do you meet the love of your life or at least a first date in person yeah how can we still do that so a lot of people ask me that and yes definitely people are still meeting in person but it is more rare, you know, mo majority of couples meet online. Um, I can share some of my techniques for doing that. So one of them is asking to be set up by friends and family. People think that they're doing that, but are you actually doing it? Are you actually saying, Hey, I really want to meet someone. I'm serious about it. Here's some pictures of me. And so if you, if you have done that, can you step it up? Another one is dating a friend. Is there a person in your friend group who you have chemistry with, who you you could see something more with? Can you, you know, go out for a drink and broach it with them and say, hey, crazy idea. Have you ever thought of us being together? And if the answer is no, you just have to move on. Wait, you're telling me you can get out of the friend zone? <laughs> Yeah, I think you can. I mean, I knew my husband for technically seven years before we started dating, but we were good friends for one year. And sometimes you just have to see somebody in a new light and people can really grow on you. Oh, wow. Well, okay. I need to Absolutely. go analyze my friend yeah. group then, that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you don't want to be creepy about it. And if someone's not interested, you have to give them space. But I think some of the most lovely relationships come out of friendships because you've already seen that person in different sides. It's like why roommates get together. It's like, I've already sort of seen you at your best and your worst. I accept you. I really like you. And now I want to be more than friends. Do you have any techniques on how to manage first date nerves? Yeah. So I think about first date nerves a lot, especially during the pandemic. People were so anxious. They felt like their skills were rusty and they hadn't made small talk in a while. And so I love this idea of a pre-date ritual, something to do to get your head in the game. And so, for example, you can listen to a great podcast, maybe this one that pumps you up. You can, <laughs> uh, you know, play music that really gets you in a good mood. You could take a bath if that helps you relax and, you know, having a good sense of smell might really bring you out of the workday and into the date. You could call a friend, really whatever it does to help you say, I'm walking into this date, I'm ready for connection. I'm separating this from what came before it. And I'm really here ready to show up. I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes through this. <laughs> so I've settled my nerves. I've been on a first date. It's went so well. Um, the stars have aligned. Um, how do I, how do I distinguish whether I should take that date to a second date? How do I detach being blinded by being blinded by the fun of the date and the compatibility itself? How do I know when to ask for a second date? Yeah. So there's a few things on this. One is that in general, I really recommend people go on second dates. I think that sometimes on the first date, people have nerves and it's hard to be yourself. And so if you just walk in saying, I'm definitely going to go on a second date with someone, the first date is almost like breaking the ice and you know that you'll give them another chance. So you could adopt this mentality of going on the second date. The second thing that I would say is I have a checklist called the post date eight. And this is a series of questions that you ask yourself after the date. And you say to yourself things like, how did I feel around this person? How did my body feel? Did I feel energized or de-energized? And what it does is it helps take you away from things like, where did they go to school? How tall are they? And it really helps you focus on the things that actually matter. And then based on that, that could help you decide if you want to see them again. So given in this hypothetical world, first date went really well. Second date went even better. They smashed the criterion 
of the um, post-88. And we're in a relationship and the spark fades. Yeah. What, are you, what are your thoughts on that? You, you can see I'm laughing too when I when I ask that question because I know yeah. you have a full, dad, a full chapter dedicated to fuck right. the spark. Right. <laughs> I mean, some people don't get into relationships in the first place because they feel like there's no spark and other people have a spark and then um, it fades. But there's tons of research on this that shows that love fades over time. In the beginning, we're addicted to love. If you put somebody in a brain scan and you see their brain, when you're in the first stages of love, it's as if you're addicted to a chemical like cocaine. And so just imagine that love really is a drug. Over time, that drug fades at the two and a half, three year mark. And we see this and it's probably a good thing because how could you get anything done if you were in that crazy fade that phase the whole time. And so part of it is understanding that relationships are going to go through phases. And in the beginning, the honeymoon phase, you can't stop thinking about them. Then you move towards a phase where, you know, you've been with them for a while and you appreciate them, but it's not exactly the same. And you might move towards a companionate stage where you really have this deep friendship, but it's maybe a little bit less romantic. And so part of it is understanding that if you just keep chasing the spark or the honeymoon phase, you're not going to get into anything deeper and that it's very healthy and natural for relationships to go through different phases. I want to map this against the male and female sex drive. I had Adam Lane Smith who studies this on the podcast not too long ago and he says the male and female sex drive heightens and lowers at certain points in the relationship. He said that the male sex drive is predicated, and I'm paraphrasing, mostly on um, physicality. Um, it's why men can look at a pair of rock shaped like boobs and feel aroused. He <laughs> says that female sex drive, I believe, is um, predicated on emotional security. So when he mapped um, male and female sex drive on a graph, the male sex drive was heightened at the beginning of the relationship and tapered down, whereas the female sex drive actually increased through moments of emotional security, whether it's engagement or whether it's a first year anniversary or um, a marriage or the birth of a child. Um, have you seen that kind of play within the work that you, that you, um, undertake? You know, I'm actually not an expert on sex drive or, or some of these like male female differences. A lot of my work is actually more about just universal concepts of how people think and how people relate. And so almost on, you know, I would say on purpose, I tend not to do as much of the like men are like this and women are like this thing. And I actually think like, what are the universal things that apply to communication, trust, honesty, choosing a life partner? And so I haven't delved as much into research like that. That, that makes complete sense to me, Logan. So you spoke about the relationship contract. What are some of the fundamental areas of discussion that you should bring up with a, a potential partner once you've kind of surpassed those initial months and you've embedded yourself into a kind of what seems like a long lasting relationship? Yeah, it always surprises me certain things that people don't talk about. I, I was talking to a client who'd been with his partner for a year and they hadn't talked about religion or having kids or political views. And I was just like, these are critical things that are going to be part of your life growing up, you know, as you grow together. And so I would say, you know, the list differs for people. It depends on what matters to you, but certainly things like, where do you think we're going? Are you looking for a monogamous relationship? Um, what are we doing? Are we in a relationship? Are we not? Um, do you want kids? Where do you want to live long-term? I think really painting a picture for someone of what you want your life to look like and having them paint a picture for you and seeing if it's compatible. And the mistake that I see people make is that they just assume, well, I like you so much. I bet we want the same things. What inevitably ends up happening is that there is a big disconnect, but because you didn't think to ask those questions or you were afraid to ask those questions, you find out after you've probably wasted some time. Is the concept of breaking up with someone taboo? Most people that I observe, whether it's friends or family, treat relationships like investments. They want to hold on for as long as possible and hope that it, at some point fluctuates and garners a return. However, I think that's a very outdated and wrong way to look at relationships. Like we spoke about earlier, you fail, fail, often, fail often not big. Is breaking up with someone a taboo thing to do? Yeah, you know, I think if you've been in a marriage for many years, there's a lot of implications. You you share a house, you might share a family, you share friends. Like I think breakups are very serious and they have serious implications for your life, but 
in terms of it being taboo, I think that there's a lot of times when breakups are necessary. And so one of the important things that I like to spread is this idea that your relationship should not just be based on the longevity. What if you actually have a really unhappy relationship where you don't feel like yourself and someone hurts your feelings and you feel down all the time, but yeah, technically you've been married for 50 years. Is that really admirable? And so sometimes the best way to get into a great relationship is to get out of a bad one. And so I would say that, of course, during a breakup, You should be really serious about why am I doing this? Have I tried everything I can? Have I expressed my needs to this person? You know, I would treat it with respect and honesty, but no, I don't think breakup should be taboo because sometimes we are with people that don't bring out the best in us. I'm really hoping that at this point I have zero listeners tuning in because they've actioned everything that we've said so far. They've found love or or helped grow their own relationship that they've got. But in the unfortunate chance that they haven't and they are either experiencing heartbreak themselves or have the notion that they might have to pursue um, breaking up with someone. Firstly, how would you first of all navigate breaking up with someone? I, I love the concept of hitchers and ditchers within your book. If you are, if the listeners are someone who feels inclined to yeah. escape a bad relationship, how would you recommend that they do it? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's so hard and oftentimes people want to break up with someone for a long time before they do it. And it just does sort of take this build of confidence and accountability. And so I, in my book, I talk about how you can think about breaking up with someone as a goal and then use goal setting research to do that. And so for example, um, you can tell a friend, you can say, Hey, you know, I I've decided this isn't the right relationship for me. I want to break up with this person. And then you can say to them, like, if I don't do it, then you can take this check and cash it for this politician that I don't like, or you can post this embarrassing photo of me on Instagram. And the whole point is that you have a goal you want to achieve. There are things that are holding you back like fear or procrastination, and your friend will help you achieve your goal by holding you accountable to it. Another thing you can do is prepare the conversation and think about how do I want to open it? You know, maybe I want to say, I appreciate everything we've had together, but I don't think that we're the right match. And you can talk about good times and then you can be very clear about the fact that, you know, this is the end for you and you don't want to be ambiguous. You want to say, Hey, maybe I thought perhaps we should break up. You say like, I don't want to be in this anymore. And I also recommend something like making a plan for afterwards so that you don't have sex with that person. Really don't do anything that's going to pull you back in. So you want to have a conversation that's clear. You're not being ambiguous about what happened. And maybe you have a plan to help you recover afterwards and really resist that urge to be there for the person and be the person who makes them feel better. Because, you know, of course you want to make sure that they're fine, but you also need to start detaching yourself. What I love mostly about your work is that you use decision-making models that could be used in personal development and other aspects and something that, I think that's why your your book's such a runaway success, is that we're using these decision-making models that we would use in other aspects of our lives in a traditional, in a non-traditional aspect of our lives where these models haven't been used before. And one of the, the models I enjoyed most about reading your book was the concept of framing. Mm-hmm. Um, I learned that um, through your book that heartbreak is a feeling much like grief or mm-hmm. coming off some sort of substance addiction. It's clearly a traumatic circumstance for an individual. So from the lens of one of the most respected and expert thinkers in the field, how important is framing when it comes to being broken up with? Yeah, you know, it's it hurts. It's really painful. Like we experience rejection as physical pain and there's tons of research on this. And so if you've been broken up with um, and you're experiencing pain, that's absolutely normal. But what I propose is that how can you frame the breakup as a gain and not a loss? And there are exercises that you can do. So things like um, writing yourself a list of why your life is going to be better without this person. Maybe they were always... Um, making you late to the airport or, you know, maybe you could never watch your favorite shows or they didn't like the beach. You know, what are the things that you'll get back from not being with this person? You can also journal about the bad parts of the relationship. Um, Maybe they weren't respectful. Maybe they weren't kind to your family. And so really just helping yourself focus on why this is a gain. And then there's also something that you can do called self-discovery activities where you re-engage in parts of yourself that you like, but that you 
put on hold during the relationship. And so it's all about saying like, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. I'm going to actively convince myself why this is something that will help me move forward and achieve my goals. Logan, I feel so grateful that I've had you unpick the whole dating life cycle front to back and from reading your book. It's been so fun. And one of the standalone lessons that I've gained from your book is to never get back with your ex. That seems to be a common piece of advice that you have um, chapter after chapter after chapter. Why shouldn't someone get back with their ex or at least leave the door open? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you said exactly. It's about leaving the door open. And we know from research that we want to have those doors open. We want to have what's known as optionality, but actually it's much better to have the door being closed because when the door is closed, you can say, um, which direction do I want to go in? And you can think about new opportunities. But when you have many open doors, you start saying, oh, you know, I could go back to this person. I could go to that person. It's actually, it prevents you from moving forward. And so close that door, stop talking to your ex, and that will help a new person emerge in your life. Boom. What a sound piece of advice, Logan. This has been such a whirlwind conversation. I've admired your work for years. I've enjoyed your book before I even imagined having you on the podcast. So this is a really full circle moment for me, Logan. If people want to engage with your work and support you and perhaps get some coaching off you or even sign up for your newsletter, how best can I say and post that in this podcast? Yeah. First of all, David, thank you so much for being so prepared and such an enthusiastic interviewer. It was really fun. If people want to engage with me, they can follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Logan Yuri, And then on my website, loganyuri.com, they can sign up for my newsletter. I also teach a class called Propel. It's a boot camp for dating. I have people from all over the world who take it. And it's a really fun way to up-level your skills, find a community of daters. And I've had a lot of success stories. So I recommend that people check it out. I recommend it too. I hope we have some Scottish accents on that book camp. Me too. Um, I'm, I'm really, really delighted that you've stopped by today. Thanks for the privilege, Logan. Thank you so much.